but to know how I could possibly proclaim God more loudly than what just happened here. It's so beautiful. Um, before we get started, kiddos, Miss Monica is prepared for Children's Church, so if you would like to go, you are welcome to. However, if you want to stay with us, that's okay too. So I'm going to give you a second. Your little footprints on their way out the door. <laughs> Not prints, steps, I guess. <laughs> They're going to go have fun and learn more about God's word together. Oh, you look great this morning. Let's go ahead and start um, our message with prayer. Father God, we are grateful to you for who you are, for your great, great love for us. And we, we feel you in this place. Holy Spirit, you are strong amongst your people this morning. We thank you for that. And Lord, we, we ask that as we open your word, that you would lead and guide, Lord, that you would form us, shape us in your image, Lord, um, through the proclamation of your word. Lord, let these be your words, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're finishing up our sermon series on Ezra. Not the easiest book, <laughs> but, we've, but we've been working through it really well, talking about how God restores his people. And, uh, you know, we've taken a couple side, side tours. We, you know, saw the Free Methodist Foundation and had some VBS, which was amazing. Um, a super exciting time. And so now we're at the end of the book of Ezra, and we're going to talk about chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Ezra. Um, and so our theme this morning, our whole theme for the series has been God Restores, but today we're going to talk about how God restores relationship which is really apropos given what Bob just talked about, about how um, relationship is so important. It's foundational, right? It's everything about who we are. We are, we are made up by people who have different relationships that form us, that shape us, and of course, our most important relationship with our Savior. It's the way we connect to each other, and it's the way we connect to God. And our relationship with God is so important because he's the one who created us. He knows us better than we can know ourselves, the good and the bad, and loves us most. It's the most important and special relationship we have. It gives us strength, wisdom, guidance, consolation, comfort. It's such a blessing. But I don't know about you, it's pretty easy, like, to be in a relationship with someone, even God, and get really comfortable, right? Who gets really comfortable in your relationships, right? And then what happens? We take it for granted. Let's, let's, you, you probably don't do that, but it happens to me sometimes, okay? Um, and it happens to God's people in the book of Ezra. It's really easy when, like, things are going great, and we're really close, we're good friends, you're there for me always. We say those kinds of things. I know, that's my ride or die. That person's there for me no matter what. They love me no matter what. But if you don't pay attention to a relationship, sooner or later, it's going to atrophy, right? It's not going to grow. It's going to cease to exist because it hasn't been fed. And then division's going to happen, and there are going to be problems. And so in Ezra 9, we're at this place where things have been going pretty good for the Israelites. You know, we started the book of Ezra, and things were not so good. The people, God's people, the Israelites, they were in exile. They'd been defeated by Babylon. Babylon, they had torn down the temple. They were sent to live far away. But then, you know, Cyrus and Persia, they come in, and they defeat ba the Babylonians, and Cyrus says, you can go back, and you can build your temple. And it's kind of an interesting time for them, you know. They, they start off really well, but then things don't go so well. And then eventually they're back on track. And yay, the temple's built. And woohoo, it's good times. And they're even allowed a little bit of self-leadership. And things are going so much better. They're gathering together as God's people. They're worshiping. They're praising. They're happy. Things are good. And then guess what? We got a problem. Okay, so at the beginning of Ezra 9, we start to hear about this problem. Later, the Jewish leaders came to me and said, many Israelites, including priests and Levites, are living just like the people around them. They are even guilty of some of the horrible sins of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Some Israelite men 
have married foreign women and have let their sons do the same thing. Our own officials and leaders were the first to commit this disgusting sin, and now God's holy people are mixed with foreigners. This news made me so angry, this is Ezra talking, that I ripped my clothes and tore hair from my head and beard. But then I sat in shock until the time for the evening sacrifice. Many of our people, people were greatly concerned and gathered around me because the God of Israel had warned us to stay away from foreigners. At the time of the evening sacrifice, I was still sitting there in sorrow with my clothes all torn. So I got down on my knees, then lifted my arms, and I prayed. So there's this problem with intermarriage. And it sounds like maybe this is some kind of a racial problem, right? But that's really not what's going on at all. There's a cultural problem. God is trying to protect his people. He's trying to keep them holy, set unto themselves, so that they can do the work that God has planned for them. But the problem is, they're marrying people of pagan faith. And now they're becoming a, that's becoming a part of who they are. It's kind of changing the culture. And so people who were faithful to God are starting to worship these pagan gods and participate in pagan rituals. And this is a really, really big problem. Because here's the thing. At the very beginning of Ezra, they're in a bad place. And the reason the Israelites are in a bad place is because they have not been doing what God said. They've been ignoring his prophets. They've been ignoring the things that God has been trying to do with them. They've been, you know, disobedient. So here we are, and there's suddenly this disobedience again. And this has been an ingrained thing in them. Like, don't intermarry into these pagan religions. Like, God has told them this even back as far as Exodus. Exodus 34, 11 through 16 says, God says, I will force out the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, but you must do what I command you today. Don't make treaties with any of these people. If you do, it will be like falling into a trap. Instead, you must destroy their altars and tear, tear down the sacred poles that they use to worship the goddess Asherah. I demand, you com I demand your complete loyalty. You must not worship any other god. Don't make treaties with these people there, or you will soon find yourself worshiping their gods and taking part in their sacrificial meals. Your men will even marry their women and be influenced to worship their gods. This that was said way back in Exodus is being fulfilled now amongst the people during Ezra's time. And it's not okay. They've begun to adopt the culture of, these pa of people who have pagan religion, They've begun to worship idols. We know how God feels about that, right? And this is why Ezra has this huge reaction. God has brought them so far. What is happening amongst the people now? Well, there's comfort, right? We're good now. We can do what we want. God took care of us. It's okay. And they kind of stop really nurturing this connection this relationship with God, and they start doing what they want to do. They start becoming lazy with the things that they've been commanded to do. And so what does Ezra do? He repents very publicly, right? He's, he's in sackcloth, and he's tearing his clothes, and he's tearing his hair, and he's tearing his beard. I can only imagine what a sight this must have been for people. And he falls on his knees, and he prays. And this is a portion of his prayer found in um, Ezra 9, 13 through 15. You punished us because of our terrible sins, but you did not punish us nearly as much as we deserve, and you have brought us back home. Why should we disobey your commands again by letting our sons and daughters marry these foreigners who do such disgusting things? The disgusting things are the idol worship that would make you angry enough to destroy us all. Lord God of Israel, you have been more than fair by letting a few of us survive. But once again, our sins have made us ashamed to face you. When I hear that, that ashamed to face you, I can't help but think back on, on the first sin, Adam and Eve. They're in, they're, when they eat from the fruit, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and 
if you guys remember, what happens when God comes walking in the garden after that? They hide. There's disconnection because there's sin that has disrupted their relationship with God. There's shame. And that's what Ezra's talking about. He's talking about shame. Shame separates us from God. Of course, we want to avoid those things that would bring shame upon us, that would separate us from God, because God is all about relationship. He doesn't want to be disconnected from us, which is why he, he gave such clear and thorough instructions. But the problem is, if you're not staying close and tied into God, it's really easy to not think about what God wants you to do, to not pay attention to those things that you've been taught from childhood or from the time that you began your faith. We have to be consistent and connected. It's really important. It's what God wants. But sin must be dealt with. And this big mess that happened with all this intermarrying, it had to be dealt with. And this messy problem has a terribly messy solution, unfortunately. What ends up happening is the people discuss and decide that the remedy for this solution is for all these intermarried people, for the Israelites to divorce their spouses and send them away with their children. It's a terrible thing. A messy, messy solution to a messy, messy problem. I will be honest with you, if you look at, if you look at this piece of scripture, nowhere do they say, God, what should we do? And I, I think that's troubling, you know, because it's a very sad solution. They don't, they don't go to God and say, what should we do? They just take it upon themselves, and they do what, think they, sh what they think they should do. Um, but I will tell you that eventually, they do better. The Israelites, you know, we don't find out about it until way into Nehemiah. But in the book of Nehemiah, we learn that, you know, Ezra reads the Torah amongst them all. He spends a whole day reading it out loud, and, and it brings upon tears and repentance and they start worshiping and, and observing festivals and doing the things that God has called them to do as a people. And once again, they, they find unity in God. They reconnect, and the relationship is there, and God is able to work amongst them. Now, we are so blessed because we get into messes, right? <laughs> our sin can cause a mess in our life. But through this, this people... God raised up a Savior, his one and only Son. And for us to reconnect our relationship with God, we need only run to him. We need only admit that we are sinners that need a Savior. And like Ezra, we need to repent when we have been wrong. We need to turn that over to God. We need to say it to God and give it over to him. And then we need to commit to that relationship. And we're going to have to do that over and over and over again because we're human, right? And relationships, we just don't stay focused that long. <laughs> I wish we did. And some of us do better than others, and sometimes we have long spans in our lives where we're able to be really committed. But I tell you, friends, the best thing we can do is to commit every single day to that connection. Because here's the thing, God's never going to sever that connection with us. He may allow us to live the consequences of our sin, and that's what he did with the Israelites. He allowed them to live the consequences of their sin. But he's never gone. He always wants that connection. He always is there if we turn to him. We need only call out. So I want to pray this morning. I just want us to renew that. Wherever you're at in this process, whether you need new connection with Christ or whether you just need to reaffirm that connection or if you need to give God a high five and say, we're so good, God, I'm so, I'm so happy with our relationship, you can do that. But if you'd close your eyes and pray with me. Father God, you are so good to us and you love us so much. So much so that we can come to you in whatever state we are in. And Lord, we confess that, that we are sinners. We sin. We make poor choices, God. But we thank you that you are a God who forgives. You are a God who is there in whatever state we were in. And so, Lord, we are sorry for our sin, and we ask your forgiveness, and we commit to a life that is about following you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. And we know that God answers that prayer, right? That he is with us. Romans 12, 2, I think, is really helpful. And my brother out there, VJ, already quoted it this morning. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew the connection. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We want to live in God's will. So let us renew our faith. Let us renew our relationship with him because he is always there for us. Amen.